We shall now turn to Ephesians chapter 5, and our text for this evening is verse 19. Ephesians 5, verse 19. We could start from verse 18. Be filled with the Spirit, speaking to yourselves and psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord. Now recently I preached a sermon on uh, 20 reasons why we should only sing psalms. God has given us this wonderful songbook, the book of Psalms, 150 brilliant psalm, psalms that are inspired by the Holy Spirit, authored by God himself, and he expects us to use it. And we notice the reference here to psalms, to hymns, and spiritual songs. The word spiritual, when it's used like that in the Bible, it's used many times. Every time apart from one, it's used of the Holy Spirit, songs of the Holy Spirit. The other time it's used of spiritual wickedness of the devil. But spiritual songs are songs inspired by the Spirit. Psalms are songs inspired by the Spirit. And hymns are the titles given to some of the Psalms in the Greek translation of the Old Testament, the Septuagint. So we saw then that the songbook God wants us to use in our public worship is the book of Psalms. What I'd like us to do tonight is to look at the question of musical instruments. Music has always had a part to play in human society. We read in Genesis 4, 21, about a man named Jubal, a descendant of Cain, who was the first man to invent musical <coughs> instruments. And ever since these early days, musical instruments have been invented and played. <coughs> we read, for example, when the uh, children of Israel came out of Egypt, they had a wonderful victory over the Egyptians at the Red Sea. God took them through the Red Sea as on dry land. Moses um, composed a song which the Israelites sang. And then after that we read that Miriam and some of the ladies of Israel took timbrels and danced and praised um, and rejoiced together. So music was used as a, a national celebration in that situation. Later on we read about David, the um, shepherd boy, and how he learned to play the harp, and how when Saul was troubled with an evil spirit, they sent for David, and he would play the harp, and uh, that would soothe uh, Saul and calm his spirits. So music had its role to play, and of course it has today. We have it in our houses, in our society. But what about worship? That's what we're really dealing with tonight. Now, interestingly, in the early worship of the Old Testament, musical instruments were not used apart from trumpets, which called people to worship, which, anew which announced feasts, sounded the alarm, gathered the congregation together. Moses had to make this silver trumpet, which he used. It's not until the time of David that God commands musical instruments to be used in worship, and they were used simply in the temple worship, in the worship uh, connected with the feasts, with the sacrifices, with the offerings, with the priests, 
and so on. But you come to the present day and you find that there are very few churches which don't have instrumental music. And in some modern churches which have contemporary music, music very much dominates everything. But what I would like to do tonight is to give 15 reasons, 15 reasons why we shouldn't have instrumental music in our public worship. You may have it in your home, you may listen to it in your car, you may play instruments, but when it comes to public worship, certain things are required and certain things are forbidden. The first and most important reason of all why we shouldn't have music in our churches is that there was no music in the New Testament church. There's no mention of musical instruments in the New Testament. People might say, oh, well, that's just an argument from silence. Uh, you can't really go too far on that. Maybe they had musical instruments, but uh, it just so happened that it was never mentioned in all the books of the New Testament. But we know that there was no musical instruments used in the New Testament church because the early church fathers, the early writers, all condemned the use of musical instruments. There was unanimity in the condemnation of the use of instrumental music in the worship of God. Now, if music had been practiced in the New Testament church, there's no way that there wouldn't be at least some voices in favor of instrumental music in the early church, but it was universally condemned. Now, the Lord Jesus commissioned his apostles to be the kind of foundation of the church, the foundation of the apostles and prophets. They were to be the ones who set up the church. And you remember how Jesus gave the great commission in Matthew chapter 28. Go ye therefore into all the world, teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe whatsoever I commanded you. So that was their commission. And that's what they sought to do. Peter and John and Paul and all the rest, they sought to establish the church. And they laid down a pattern for others to follow. Paul would say, be followers of me as I am of Christ. They set down the purest pattern for us. And that pattern was worship without instrumental music. So that's the first reason it wasn't there in the New Testament church. The second reason is that it wasn't there until the 13th century. Thomas Aquinas is the greatest Roman Catholic theologian. And writing in 1250, Thomas Aquinas said, our church does not use musical instruments as that would be Judaizing the church, taking it back to what it did in the temple, Judaizing it. So Thomas Aquinas is saying, our church, that's the Western church, the Western church at that time, 1250, does not use musical instruments. The Eastern Church, the Eastern Orthodox Church, doesn't use musical instruments right up till the present day. Never did, and does not at present. In the Roman Catholic Church, you've got many things coming in. The sacrifice of the Mass. You had candles and priests and vestments and uh, burning of incense, you had altars and sacrifices upon the altar, the sacrifice of the Mass. 
and with the coming of these dark ages. Before the Reformation, you got organs coming into the church. Instrumental music was a late invention in the, new, in the Christian church. It came in only following the time of Aquinas. So that's another reason. A third reason is that there are many directions given to us with regard to worship in the New Testament, but we're never told to use musical instruments. We're told about singing, about instructing one another, about praying together, teaching one another. We're told about how one might have a psalm and so on, and another might have a prophecy, but there's nothing about musical instruments. Fourth reason is many gifts are referred to in the New Testament. Prophecy, tongues, interpretation of tongues, helps, governments, but there's no mention of the musical gift which musicians, church musicians, would require. A fifth reason is we should do nothing in our public worship but what God commands. We need a positive command for everything we do. That's the regulative principle of worship, which Reformed Christians believe. The Roman Catholics, they believe the Pope can introduce anything he likes into worship. The Lutherans, they kind of brought about half of our Reformation. They said, you can do anything in worship but what is condemned in the Scripture. But no, we should have nothing in our worship but what is commanded in the Scripture. We don't have to look for an express forbidding of it. Rather, we have to look for a command. God said to Moses, See thou do everything according to the pattern given to thee in the mount. This regulative principle is based on the second commandment. Thou shalt not make unto thee any graven image or any likeness of anything that is in the heaven above or that is in the earth beneath. Thou shalt not bow down thyself to them nor serve them. God lays down who is to be worshipped. Everyone else was worshipping using images and pictures and icons and so on. But God commands, no, you're not to make such things. You're not to bow to them. You are to worship me as I command, following my command, and in a spiritual way. But then sixthly, when we come to the book of Psalms, there are lots of commands about using musical instruments. How are we to understand these? Psalm 150, verse 4, Praise him with stringed instruments and with organs and in the, in the dance. Or um, Psalm 92 verse 3, praise him upon stringed instruments and organs. But what we have to remember is that this was connected with temple worship. It was the same as bringing burnt offerings and sin offerings and peace offerings, coming with your sacrifices, coming with your incense. Now these musical instruments in worship were introduced in the time of David and by the commandment of God in the time of David. 2 Chronicles 29 verse 25, for example, is one of these passages which states that God commanded that musical instruments should be used in the temple worship. But what we notice is that these musical instruments were not played by anybody. They were always played by the Levites. And that again shows how they were connected with the symbolical, typical worship of the Old Testament. 
feast days, the trumpet would be blown, new moons, um, Psalm 81 verses 1 to 3, take up the pleasant harp and so on. But these, that was at feast days. People would <coughs> gather three times a year. The Israelite men, especially, were commanded to come to the temple to worship God. When they came to the temple, the musical instruments would be used there. They were types and symbols. But what was a musical instrument then a type of? What did it typify or symbolize? It typified joy. It was a type of Christian joy. These sacrifices and um, offerings and incense and candles and showbread and vestments and all these things, they were all pointing forward to the New Testament church and to the Lord Jesus Christ. But when Christ died, the veil of the temple was rent from the top and the, to the bottom. The temple was destroyed. The Jews destroyed the temple by crucifying Christ. And you remember when Jesus was speaking to the woman of Samaria, she said, you Jews, you say that in Jerusalem people ought to worship. We think that in Mount Gerasim, in our own temple, we should worship. Jesus said, the day is coming and now is when neither in Jerusalem nor yet in, the, in, the, in this mountain shall you worship God, but they that worship him shall worship him in spirit and in truth. The temple was being done away. It was looking forward to the New Testament age and all that was connected with the temple, the music, the drama, all, the, all that was uh, external and earthly and visible, all that passed away. The New Testament worship is to be spiritual worship. So the commands to worship in the Psalms with musical instruments are now fulfilled by us worshiping God with joy in our hearts, in spirit and in truth. A seventh reason is that musical instruments were never part of the regular worship of God, of the Sabbath worship. The Sabbath worship didn't go on in the temple. Temple was far away from many of the people, but they would gather in their synagogues, in their villages, in their towns. And how did they worship in the synagogues? They sang psalms without musical instruments. They read the scriptures. They prayed and they preached. They kept the day holy by gathering there every Sabbath to be taught, to read, to pray, and to sing. There was never music in the synagogues. Up to the present day, music is not used in the Orthodox synagogues. So musical instruments was part of the special worship connected with the temple, not the regular every, uh, every Sabbath worship in the synagogues. The eighth reason is that New Testament worship grew naturally out of the synagogues. Wherever Paul went, wherever he went to preach, to the different towns across the empire, he always went first to the synagogue. And there he would worship with the Jews and they would ask him to expound the scriptures and he would preach and he would continue there, worshiping with them and preaching and teaching until they cast him out of the synagogue. And then he would set up his own synagogue, his Christian synagogue, and there he continued to worship in just the same pattern as they were used to worshiping in before. Singing the Psalms, reading the scriptures, preaching the word, and praying to God. 
So the New Testament churches grew out of the synagogues and followed the synagogue pattern. Ninthly, we're told here, speaking to yourselves in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord. Making melody in your heart. What does that mean? Literally, it means pulling on the, as it were, the harp strings of your heart. That's this, the idea that we have there. The literal meaning of the words. Plucking the strings of your heart. Not plucking a guitar or plucking a harp, but plucking the strings of your heart. That's what God is looking for in our worship. He's looking for inner worship simple worship, spiritual worship, making melody in your heart, singing with your voice and making music in your heart to God. Not the outward external music, but the music of the heart. Singing with your voice, making melody in your heart. Tenthly, when the reformers came along, in the 16th century, they threw out musical instruments. Swingley, well, the Swiss reformer, was a very proficient musician. He would have no musical instruments in the church. Similarly, Calvin and Beza and John Knox, these reformers, they would have nothing to do with musical instruments. They wanted pure, simple heart worship. And then the next century, the Puritans. Again, the Puritans would have nothing to do with musical instruments. And similarly, the early Dutch Puritans. Now, the Dutch Reformed churches today, some of them are very strong on just singing psalms, like the Heritage Reformed Church and the Free Reformed Church, but they're also very, very keen on their organs. But the early Dutch reformers, people like Voetius, 1589 to 1676, Voetius wrote strongly against organ use in the church. These things came in later. They were condemned by the reformers. Eleventhly, we come to the Westminster Confession of Faith and the Directory of Public Worship. These are the standards of the Presbyterian Church. And in these directories, there's no place for musical instruments. Again, the directory says we're to sing psalms to God. Only psalms in the public worship without musical instruments. Twelfthly, musical instruments came into the Presbyterian churches in Scotland along with liberal theology from Germany. The liberal theology which denied the inspiration and authority of Scripture and undermined the truth of God's Word, it started coming in in the 1860s, 1870s. The organ came into the Church of Scotland in the 1870s and into the Free Church in the 1880s. It came with, li with liberalism, with a weakened attachment to the Scriptures. Liberal theology and music came together. C.H. Spurgeon, you remember, um, the great preacher of the 19th century, he had a uh, a great fight with what was called, what he called the downgrade in his own day, the, again, liberal theology. And he used to speak of the organ as that kist of, kist of, of whistles, as he called it, dismissed it, didn't want anything like that. He wanted spiritual worship. Thirteen. We have the warning of Nadab and Abihu in the book of Leviticus. They were Abraham's sons, 
And for a while they were conducting the worship of God and everything was wonderful. But then one day they thought they would invent their own kind of worship. So they came with what is called strange fire before the Lord. And you remember what happened. God burnt them up with his wrath. And Aaron was commanded not to mourn for his sons because God saw it as terribly wicked what they did. They were in charge of the worship and they introduced their own ideas into the worship. And God brought his wrath upon them. They had dishonored God by what they did. We are to worship God only as he commands. Fourteenthly, in the modern church, you get a lot of music. And a lot of music glorifies man. Contemporary worship. It's man-centered. And in some churches you go into, you would wonder where you in a church or in a nightclub. All this loud, um, raucous music. And the musicians and the directors of praise in these churches, it would seem, are more important than the preachers of the word. The musicians will play for an hour and the preacher is given 15 or 20 minutes to preach the gospel and explain the truth. The emphasis on entertainment, on pleasing man, but worship isn't for the pleasing of man. Worship is for pleasing God. The musicians are displaying their gifts and they're looking for praise. It's man-centered. And we should be seeking that which is God-centered. And finally, fifteenthly, worship should be simple, spiritual and God glorifying in spirit and in truth. In the Old Testament temple they had musical instruments, they had gold and silver and craftsmen doing beautiful work and vestments and everything was so ornate and dramatic and the priests were offering sacrifices and scattering incense and lighting lamps and it was all earthly and sensuous because it was symbolical. It was glorious with an earthly glory but was pointing forward to the New Testament worship which would be spiritual with a heavenly glory. It was all pointing to Christ. Now our worship is to be simple from the heart, meeting with God, be still and know that I am God. And even the preaching, it's not to be with a wisdom of words. It's not to be a minister showing off how eloquent he is or how clever he is. Paul says, I came not amongst you, Corinthians, with excellency of speech or of wisdom. Not at all. That would be taking the glory from God. Man has to disappear. The focus is to be on the cross, on Christ and him crucified. That's where the emphasis must be. So let's go back to New Testament worship. Genuine New Testament worship, pure worship, God-ordained worship, following the pattern that God has given us. There shouldn't be instruments in the church there was no instruments in the Christian church for a thousand years. Let our worship be God-honoring, spiritual worship, making melody in our hearts, making music in our souls, plucking, as it were, the harp strings of our heart, glorifying God, following the God-ordained pattern, adding musical instruments to the worship of God is a sin. It's a sin. Let's pray.